Well, good morning. Glad you're here this morning. Um, I don't know where that came from. That wasn't my instruction. I am wearing black today um, in respect of all the Penn State fans. I'm for you. I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling your agony this morning. So I am a Buckeye, but anyhow. So, but good, good. So, hey, it all comes back around, right? Remember last year, it was the last second, last play, decided the game. It all comes back around, right? So, good, good. Hey, well, we're in a teaching series entitled Multiply, and we're talking about the things that God desires to multiply in us. And today, we're going to talk about humility. We're talking about God's desire to, 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 to multiply humility in us. Well, you know, psychology today, the magazine, did a study on humility. They put out some criteria that represented what a humble person would be, and then they gathered information from folks of, of who it is that they thought was humble around them. Well, as they gathered this name, they began to study these folks that was pretty much considered humble by those that were around them, and this, they discovered a few things about humility. Here's some of the things they discovered. Those that were humble performed better academically. Those that were humble did better at work. Those that were humble became stronger leaders. Those that were humble had better social skills. Those that showed more humility were more forgiving, grateful, and cooperative. In fact, they even said the humble were more generous, that they gave more of their time and their talents and their treasures to others. Now, now, you know, oftentimes we, we misunderstand humility because even the idea, like in that study, where it says those that were humble were strong leaders. Like, like oftentimes we misunderstand the definition of humility. Humility is not that we would think lowly of oneself, but humility is that we would think properly about ourselves, properly about ourselves in perspective to each other and ultimately in perspective with God. So, so some statements that would be humble would be this. I'm not more important or talented than you, but I'm not less important or talented than you. That would be a proper perspective. That would be a humble statement. I, I'm, I'm below God. I'm below God, but yet he loves me so much. That would be a humble statement. I have something to contribute in this world. I have something to give. I, I can make a difference where it is that God has placed me. That would be a humble statement. It would be a proper perspective of who you are in relationship to each other, in relationship to the world, in relationship with God. Well, Jesus has an interesting way that he uses, a story he tells, to, to kind of elevate the importance of humility in our life. It's in Luke 18, 9 through 14, and this is what it says. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told them this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus, we thank you for your word and the difference that it makes in our life, the great instruction that we receive from it, the way that it forms us and molds us. And, and Lord, this morning we submit ourselves to you for you to teach and guide and transform and work deeply in us. We give you glory and honor, Lord, this morning. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you here have ever had a caricature done of yourself? Do you know what I mean when I say that? Right, a caricature? Like you go to the fair or you go to the amusement park and, and the artist has their easel out and for a modest fee, they will take a 
feature that is a little bit prominent and they were incredibly exaggerated about you. I mean, you're paying for this. You pay them and they do it and, it, and it's comical and it's funny and you get it, and, but it's a caricature. They take something that, that, that maybe it's just a, a hair prominent and they just blow it completely out of proportion uh, for the sake of humor, for the sake of being cute, whatever that, that reason is. Well, to help us understand the way caricatures work, I have just a few I, I want to show you this morning, and, and you'll recognize the folks. I, I want you to shout out uh, when you recognize who it is. So here's the first caricature this morning. Okay, Clint Eastwood, pretty easy. Here's the next one. Chris Dodd, say thank you, Chris's roommate, for that. Chris Dodd's our children's pastor. Here's the next one. Mr. Bean. Mr. Bean. Okay, here's the next one. Brad Pitt. Brad. That's actually me. Seriously, you didn't get that? All right, Brad Pitt, let's go to the next one. Steve Walker, our family ministries pastor. Let's go to the next one. Like this is my favorite one in the whole bunch. I mean, man, they really exaggerate some features on him, don't they? It's kind of scary. Okay, let's go to the next one. I don't look like that, do I? I mean, is this like really prominent on me? Is that? All right, let's go to the next one. Albert Einstein. So we see when we look at these caricatures that, that obviously what's happened is, is that a certain feature is taken and it's blown completely out of proportion, but yet they're still somewhat recognizable. We well, you know Jesus in his parable today tells us a story that he greatly exaggerates. Why, for instance, he takes, a, he takes a, a little good trait in the tax collector and he blows it up into being big. And he takes a little bit of the bad trait of the Pharisee and he blows it up and makes it really bad. But you do know, when Jesus would tell this story, when he would lay out the caricatures in this parable today, that in his day, the folks would struggle with them. They would struggle with the picture that he was painting about the Pharisee and about the tax collector. For instance, although we read the parable and almost immediately we do not like the Pharisee, in Jesus' day, they liked the Pharisee. In fact, they were somewhat heroic. And, 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 and we read the parable today and we, we see the tax collector and, and we're, 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 we're empathetic with them. We're sympathetic with them. We, 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 we tend to like the tax collector. But in Jesus's day, the crowd wouldn't have any of it. You, you don't believe me. You don't believe perhaps that that's the way that it works. All you would have to do in Jesus's day is ask a very simple question. It's a simple question, but it's an emotional question. You could ask this question in the crowd that day. You could ask anybody there, would you want your daughter to marry a tax collector? Now, that would be a ridiculous question. In fact, it'd have to be rhetorical because everybody in the crowd would say, absolutely not. I don't want my daughter to marry a tax collector. Well, but, but wait a minute. What about the tax collector in Jesus's story? I don't care who the tax collector is or what story he's in. I don't want the tax collector in Jesus' story for my daughter. Now, now that's kind of strange, isn't it? But the reality is, in, in Jesus' story, he makes the tax collector out to be the hero. He is the one that, that Jesus calls justified, meaning that he's right with God. And he's the one that Jesus calls humble, which means he's, he's on his way to be exalted. In Jesus' parable, he portrays the tax collector in friendly terms. And the way it ought to work is any friend of Jesus ought to be a friend of ours. Better yet, any friend of Jesus ought to be a perfect son-in-law. I mean, dead center perfect, except no one in Jesus' day was buying that. They weren't buying this, this story of the tax collector. And, and although in the story it's true, the tax collector was in the temple and that's a good thing. And the tax collector was praying and, and that's a good thing. But let's call a spade a spade. I mean, these folks, they, they have experience with tax collectors. And, and, and a tax collector was a tax collector for Rome's sake. And not that he was Roman because he wasn't Roman. I mean, he was a Jew, but he worked for Rome. And let me explain how this works. 
So Israel was occupied by Rome. And, and, and as they were occupied by Rome, they were oppressed. The Jews were an occupied people, meaning they had no control over their destiny. They didn't have a control over their nation. They didn't have control over the politics. They certainly didn't have control over the taxes. Rome set the taxes and the Jews paid them. But even though Rome set them, Rome didn't collect the taxes. Rome got a few Jews to agree that they would collect the taxes for the oppressors. And then Rome cut a deal with them. And the deal sounded a little bit like this. Rome would look at these few individuals that agreed to collect the taxes and they would say, we're going to give you this territory. And we expect so much money, so much taxes out of this territory. We're going to send you in the name of Rome. We're going to back you in the name of Rome. And if necessary, we will give you the muscle you need to collect the taxes you want to collect. Now, how you collect the taxes? We really don't care how you collect them. We just want our share of the taxes. So you can go ahead and, and make the taxes whatever you want it to be. Man, go ahead and, and make the taxes whatever it is that the market can bear. Whatever you can get out of these folks, you get it out of them. Just send us our share and you can keep the rest. We don't really care how much you collect. Well, with that sort of mandate and with that sort of muscle, man, those first century Jewish tax collectors, they did all right. In fact, some people would say they did more than all right. Maybe some people would say, they made out like bandits. And that's exactly the way the people thought about them. The people thought they were bandits, if not traitors to the very cause. I mean, it's one thing to work for the oppressor, but it's a whole different thing to profit thanks to the muscle of the oppressor. So, so most people, most people, they didn't take it. I mean, they, they wanted nothing to do with tax collectors. Tax collectors may do pretty well financially, but they didn't have many friends. And there weren't too many moms or dads that were like waiting around to be the, to be the father or mother-in-law of a tax collector. Even, even if it represented, and forgive me here, even if it represented your homely, homebound, hopelessly hard to marry off daughter, even if it meant it was her best and last chance, your response would be not a tax collector. No way. But you know, in Jesus' story, there's somebody else. And that somebody else would be a really good catch for your daughter. I mean, if your daughter could land the other guy, whoo, man, it would be like, you'd be set, she'd be set on easy street. It would be a great thing for the whole family. It would elevate everybody. You find him in the temple also, and he's praying. But you know, he doesn't cheat, he doesn't steal, he doesn't fool around. I mean, this guy tithes. Do you know the percentage of Christians that tithe? I mean, it's minuscule, but this guy tithes without a problem. I mean, and he doesn't just give from his agricultural holdings, he gives from everything he makes. And he doesn't nitpick about it. He doesn't quibble. When the Sabbath rolls around, man, he just opens up the envelope and in it pours the money. I mean, he donates to everything there is to donate, to the building fund, to the missions fund, to the benevolence fund, to the, to, to the indebtedness fund. He gives to the operational fund at the church. Do you know in that day, the temple collected for 13 different areas, 13 trumpets they had set up, and he poured cash into every one of them. And, and, you know, almost every time he showed up, he showed up with two huge bags of groceries. But he didn't really need groceries. You read the story. He fasts. And not just once a week, he fasts twice a week. Now, does anybody here know how many times, according to the, to the Torah, you have to fast? Anybody know? How much requirements there would be to fast in the Torah? You have to fast one time. And not one time a week one time a year you're required to fast on the Day of Atonement. Other than that, you're not required to fast. But here this Pharisee is, and, and man, he fasts once a week, he fasts twice a week. I mean, you talk about somebody giving 101%, this Pharisee, man, he went overboard. I mean, he fasted 104 times when he was required to do it one time. I mean, I mean you can't ask for more when you're, when you're looking at a Pharisee, but there's more. It's almost like as seen on TV commercials, right? 
I mean, I mean, I mean, he is a part of a group that is considered national heroes. Did you know this? We often don't talk about this, but this is true about the Pharisees. They were seen as national heroes because they stood up against the oppressors. They didn't make backroom deals. They didn't trade, trade uh, resources underneath the table like the Sadducees did. They didn't do that. They wanted nothing to do with it, man. They stood up for the people and they stood up against the oppressors. They did not compromise. I, I mean, one simple story is, is 15 years before Jesus was born, uh, King Herod wanted to test his popularity. So he required that everybody in Palestine line up and, and kind of dedicate, take an oath that they will be loyal to the king. Now, Josephus, the Jewish historian, he tells us what happens. So Josephus tells us that, that most people in Palestine took the oath because they were afraid of what the king would do to them. So most of them just took the oath to, to get out from underneath the pressure or, or the threat. But there was one group and only one group that refused to take the oath. And you guessed it, it was the Pharisees. Do you know how many Pharisees there were in that day? 6,000 Pharisees. And every one of them stood strong. Every one of them refused to take the oath. In fact, this is what they said. We don't take an oath to anyone but God. And you know what? Herod punished every single one of them because of it. And not one cracked. Whew. Man, they were heroes. Why, well, 15 years later, the, the, the king, King Herod, was, uh, became ill. In fact, this was the same year that Jesus was born. And, and the Pharisees knew that when Herod died, there was going to be a lot of political turmoil. And they thought they would use the opportunity to, to grab some things back for the people. One of the things they wanted to grab was the temple. They wanted to make the temple sacred again for them. So, so they got together a group of Pharisees and, and, they, and they went to the temple and they climbed the gate one night. Because in the temple court, Herod had put this huge golden eagle which was the symbol of Rome. And to everybody in Israel, that golden eagle was like, was like desecrating the temple. There's this Roman symbol in, in the middle of such a sacred place. So these Pharisees, they climb the wall and they go up and they tie a big rope around that eagle and they pull it down. And when they pull it down, it was a moment of national pride in Israel. It was like when, 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 when in Moscow, they, they pulled down the statue of Lenin. Or a few years ago, when the Iraqis pulled down the statue of Saddam Hussein, it was one of those type of moments. All of Israel celebrated. Well, you know, these men that, that did this, they were eventually caught. They were caught and they were ordered to be burned alive. All of them were brought in. All of them lined up. All of them burned alive. And every single one of them was a Pharisee. I mean, they were, they were heroic. They, they were seen by people to be celebrated and, and, and powerful. I mean, they were the genuine article. So although if you'd have been in the temple in Jesus' story and somebody would have leaned over and said, hey, would you like that tax collector to be your son-in-law? Would you like him to marry your daughter? You go, no way, but I'll take him. Or I'll take this Pharisee or I'll take that Pharisee or I'll take any Pharisee sight unseen because, man, they are heroic. But, but somehow, Jesus flips them in this story. So somehow he, he turns them upside down. And in fact, the only reason it's bearable and the only reason I think it's acceptable in that day is because he uses prayer to do it. He reveals who they are through prayer. And everyone knows this. They, they knew, knew it in Jesus' day. We know it today. That prayer reveals the central structure of the soul. Let me say that again. Prayer reveals the central structure of the soul. How we pray, what we pray, our level of faith in God that we pray to, if we pray at all. Because maybe we don't pray at all. But prayer reveals one thing. Prayer reveals the central structure of our soul. 
I mean, we learn a lot about ourselves through prayer. We, we find out something about the Pharisee in this story through prayer that we, that we don't like. We find out something that's absolutely unbelievable to us about the tax collector in this prayer. But did you ever wonder, as, as Jesus like spun this story, did you ever wonder why Jesus exaggerated the, the negative in the Pharisee? I mean, somebody who, who most people would look at and, and they, would, they would consider them to be noble, honorable people. I mean, I mean, why would Jesus exaggerate the negative in them? Why would he like make the story out that he ends up in a prominent place, that his prayer is self-promotional, that he's looking down at other people? I mean, why, why would Jesus do that? You know, here's, here's one of the reasons that, that I think, and you may have others, but... But I think he wants to illustrate to us how dangerous pride is. That pride is a dangerous thing. Or, or, or maybe this, because this is ultimately the result of pride, right? Maybe what Jesus wanted to reveal to us, how easy it is to become self-sufficient rather than God-dependent. And maybe that was Jesus' point. Maybe Jesus' point is the most noble among us the best of us, we are just a paper thin away from becoming self-sufficient instead of God-dependent. It's such a huge temptation, and the best of us can fall to it so easily to become self-sufficient rather than God-dependent. Let, let me ask you this. When you don't go to God, like when you have things happening in your life or every day or just through life, when you don't go to God, why do you not go to God? You know what I tend to think, and, and I just base it on, you know, anecdotal conversations I've had, but this is what I think. I think when you don't go to God or I don't go to God, it's, it's most of the time not because of pride. It's not pride that, that, that causes us not to go to God. I think more times than not, we don't want to bother God with our stuff. Did you ever been there? I just don't want to bother God with my stuff. Or, or we think, well, the things I'm dealing with is like, is like not important. And, you know, considering when you look at the whole world and everything everybody's going through, I mean, what I'm going through really isn't that important. So, so for me to come to God, I mean, that's just like, wow, you know, with my stuff in comparison to everything else. Or, or maybe, maybe we just feel like we're not that important. Maybe the real issue is, is we just, we just don't feel we're important enough to come before him. Now, now, you know, I think that's the reason the tax collector shows up in this story. Because of the issue that, that more times than not, we, we feel like we're not important enough. That, that, that's the only reason I can figure out why Jesus would take this tax collector, who would be considered one of the most despicable characters of his day, and, and make him acceptable. Because he sort of elevates him. The only reason I can figure it out is, is, because, is because somehow God's trying to tell us he is available to everyone and anyone. I mean, if he's available to this tax collector, then, then obviously God is available to, to, to me. So on one hand, in the parable, he's, he's warning us of how close we all can live to self-sufficiency and at the same time, he's telling us that God is available to us and for us all of the time. And then one thing that's obvious, right, about the story, one thing that's obvious is that, is that he elevates the idea of humility. Humility is so important. Why, why, do you, why do you think he elevates humility? You know, do, do you think it's because he knew what psychology today just figured out? Do you think he knew, hey, if my people were humble, they'd perform better. I mean, they'd be better workers, they'd do, they'd do better in school, they'd get along with each other better. So therefore, be ye humble so that you can be better performers. I, I, think, I think that Jesus is elevating the idea of humility because it's the key to opening up the door of God in our lives. That's, what, that's why I, I think he's doing it. A proper perspective of yourself in relationship to God. Meaning, you're not above him. 
I mean, God is God. We are not God. But, but, but at the same time, he loves you desperately. And he loves you so much. And he desires to hear from you. So if the issue is self-sufficiency versus God dependency, then, then whether you're self-sufficient because you think too high of yourself or whether you're self-sufficient because you think too low of yourself, you're still self-sufficient. Whether it's because, hey, I'm really good or, hey, I'm no good at all. Whatever the reason is, hey, I'm really important. I don't need to. Or, or man, I'm not important at all. He won't listen. What? Well, whatever your perspective is, the reality is, is you still end up being self-sufficient rather than God dependent. And humility, a proper perspective, opens up the door of God in our lives. It opens up for God to work in us and, and God to do things in us. It, it opens up God things to us. Like, for instance, it opens up forgiveness. I mean, it takes a proper perspective, right? It takes a perspective that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, that he loves me that much, that we would ever open ourselves up to receive his forgiveness. And it takes humility for us to even forgive others. I mean, ultimately, his forgiveness taking root in us that empowers us to forgive others takes, takes humility for that to happen. Why, why help and healing and wholeness and hope and, and purpose and, and his divine plan for us, it all comes through Humility through a proper perspective that God cares enough about me that he has a plan for me, that God has designed something specifically for me. Who? Well, you know, without humility, we end up being self-sufficient rather than God dependent and self-sufficient. I mean, as much as we celebrate that today, the truth is, it still all depends on you. Self-sufficiency. I mean, hey, hey, no matter how much we go, yeah, self-sufficiency, I'm my own man, I'm my own woman. The result is it still all comes down to you. You have to muster the strength. You have to be the one that provides. You have to struggle through it by the force of your will. You have to come up with all the ideas. You have to, you, you, you. But when you're God-dependent, it all depends on God. And you know what happens when, when you depend on God? Miracles. I mean, miracles can happen when you depend on God. And, and, and so the way I read this story is, 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 is Jesus promoting this, this huge idea of humility and, and balancing it by somebody who thinks too good and, and, and maybe somebody who, who might be considered too low by balancing it out that way. What God and what Jesus is saying with a little bit of humility, you come to God with a proper perspective and you open up your life for him to do his work in. And it just might be that, that he does a miracle. I mean, it just might be that, that when you come before him humbly, that he takes a marriage that is on the rocks and he revives it. It just could be that, that he takes a spouse that you've lost interest in and, and all of a sudden he fills you and, 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 and he heals you and he corrects you. And now all of a sudden that spouse is like brand new to you. I mean, it could just be that, that you come to him in humility and, and you've been struggling with your children, but, but then he gives you insight and he gives you patience and he, and he gives you like, like, like things that you didn't have in and of yourself and all of a sudden you become such a strong parent. Could be you have a perspective or an opinion or something that's happened to you in the past that is absolutely destroying you from the inside out. You come to him humbly and man, he, he corrects your perspective and your opinion and and, and maybe it could be that you're dealing with a physical ailment, but because you're humble and, and you know that God cares about you, that, that you submit yourself to healing prayer, right? And it could just be that maybe you even experience physical healing through having a proper perspective of who God is and who you are. I mean, one thing's for sure, our only chance for transformation is is humility. To be humble before him, to have a proper perspective of who he is and, and who we are in relationship with him. Now, now, have you ever wondered what humility sounds like? Do you ever wonder that? What does humility sound like? I, I threw some statements together. You probably could come up with some better ones, but I threw some statements together. And, and I think these are humble statements. I think this is what humility sounds like. I don't know the way, Lord. 
you have to show me. I can't move ahead of my own strength. I'm, I'm exhausted. You, you have to strengthen me. Lord, I, I've, ignored, I've ignored you. I've ignored your love, but yet I need you so much. I know you love me. You, you gave your life for me, and, and I know you want me to come to you. You are God. I am not. So I cast all of my life on you. I, I think humility sounds like that. Did you ever wonder what humility looks like? Did you ever wonder what humility looks like? I, I don't know, but, but, but I, think, I think maybe humility looks like this. And you don't give a rip what anybody else thinks. I think that's what humility looks like. You know what I think humility looks like? I think humility looks like this. And you could care less what anybody else thinks about it. And you really want to get crazy? I mean, you really want to like, you really want to take this humility thing to, 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 its, to its extreme? You know what else I think humility could look like? I think it could look like this. So, so where do we go with this thing? And how do we want this to like, like end today? You know what I want? I want to give you a chance to be humble. And now, now catch me. I want to give you a chance to, to not think too high but to also not think too low of yourself. I want to give you a chance to think properly about yourself. To know that God is God and there is no other. But there's also no other you to him. That you're valuable to him. That he loves you that he wants to hear from you, that, man, he wants to respond to you. And, and I want to give you a chance this morning to be humble. I want to give you a chance to, like, like respond by, by, by bringing your, your needs and your requests and, and make them known to the God that cares so much about you. And maybe you haven't done it because you think you can even handle it yourself or, or you think he doesn't care. But what I want is I want the doors of miracles, of his miracles to be thrown open in your life. So, so in the next few moments, in the next few moments, I, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. And whether that is like this, where it is you stand, or whether you kneel where you are, or whether you stretch out in the aisle, or whether you come down here to the altar and pray, man, I, I just want you to, like, throw the doors open for God's miracles to happen in your life. Let's stand and let's worship together.